Recording live from the Northeast Georgia Business Radio X studio, this is Northeast Georgia Business Radio. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back to another exciting edition of Northeast Georgia Business Radio. I'm your host, Tom Sheldon, and yes, we're coming to you live from the beautiful Empower College and Career Center of Jackson County. I have with me yet another amazing guest, but this guy might get you out of trouble if you get into trouble. I don't know. You never can tell. I have with me Mr. Alex Ward of Award Law. Alex, welcome to the Northeast Studio. Thank you, Tom, for having me. You are an attorney. I am. And I love the name, Award Law. My parents gave me a very great name. You because cashed it allowed in me right to, away, man. It allowed me to, to do that. I love it. Let's talk about your sister. Her yes, name is so Rebecca. Rebecca, if Rebe- you're listening, I hope you're listening. Hey, Rebecca. Yeah, so she's uh, so she's reward. Reward. And I'm award. Man, I tell you, your parents are cool. I don't even. I haven't met them. I just know they're cool. You are an attorney, but now you got a little bit of uh, announcing background too. You've been known to jump behind a microphone. I, I do occasionally. I I help um, run athletic events at at Norcross, and uh, that has allowed me the opportunity to occasionally fill in for basketball announcing there. And uh, because of that, I've had the opportunity to fill in occasionally at other levels. I've been at uh, Georgia Gwinnett College Baseball, filled in announcing a few of their games in the past. Uh, I've announced some games down at Georgia Tech's McCamish Pavilion for um, high school basketball, Final Four stuff. So good times. You got the voice for it, brother. I appreciate it. You do. Now, hey, real quick, our, our producer is here today, Mr. Mike Salmond. He's sitting in the back. Mike, can you make his voice sound squeaky? I don't want it sounding better than mine. He's shaking his head no. Wow, okay, okay, never mind. Again, Alex. We're going to well, try to use some auto-tune on me? Yeah, I, you know, make it make it a little squeaky. Make, make him sound like Kermit the Frog or something. He's killing me over here, man. He's going to come for my job. You know what's funny is growing up, I always wanted to be an attorney. No joke. I've seen too many TV shows and movies. And so, you know, everybody has this uh, concept of, of what an attorney is and what, is an what attorney? an attorney does. And they see the TV shows and constantly arguing in the courtroom. And first of all, I tell people, my job as a business attorney is to try to avoid court as much as possible. Right. I do not like litigation. It's Here's the thing. I work for myself. I got my own firm. You're sole, sole uh, I'm practitioner. A, I'm a sole practitioner. Right, right. When I want to go on vacation or if I need to take a, a day off here or there, or I need to go and have a meeting in the middle of the day, I don't have to ask for permission from my advice. Right. I just go and do it. Right. When you're doing litigation, you have to ask for permission from every court that you have a case pending in front of before you can get off. That's too many bosses for me. That's a lot of bosses. And I imagine if they say it, you do it. Pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty yes. much. So. You, you mentioned business law. That is what you focus on. That is. Why'd you go in that direction? You just got a business mind? I do. So gotcha. um, I actually worked with my dad the summer between my seventh grade and eighth grade years when I was 13. Saved up enough money to buy DJ equipment so that I could actually start my own DJ business. Nice. Nice. And um, so started DJing uh, when I was 13 years old, running a business doing that. Still DJ on the side occasionally. Have always been in in business. My undergrad degree is a business degree. Originally, when I went to law school, I was going to focus on intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, right, that area. And, and in fact, graduated with a uh, IP certificate, intellectual property certificate from Georgia State. The problem is anybody that's hiring an IP attorney wants somebody who can do what's called prosecuting patents. And basically when an inventor comes up with a new idea, they want to get a patent for it, you have to prosecute it. The problem is to be a member of the patent bar, you have to have a hard science background. I had a business degree, not an engineering degree. Gotcha. So at that point- Never knew that. Right. And and so while I was in law school, I still wanted to focus on the intellectual property certificate, but I started- shifting my focus to business because that's where I've been. Um, I, I've worked in management at Quick Trip. I worked in management for a pool management company in customer service and sales and uh, operations. And so I had a business mindset, and that's what I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed doing the contracts for the pool company. I got you. All right, well, I guess I guess this is uh, the best place for me to be. Now, where'd you get your law degree at? So I graduated from Georgia State University. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I applied to Georgia State and to UGA uh, because 
in-state public school tuition rates. Darn right. And There's at, nothing wrong with that. No. And at the time, uh, we actually had both Georgia State and UGA had better bar passage rates than Emory. Really? So, wow. like, hmm, I can yeah. uh, pay in three years what one year of Emory is going to cost me and still come out at least at the same spot, if not ahead. The reality is, unless you want to be a Supreme Court justice or work in really big law, I don't really care where you get your law degree from as long as you've got a law degree and you pass the bar. Uh-huh. I will say Georgia State, um, they opened a new building my second year there, and, and it is a great program. I, I really enjoyed my time there. Nice. So you have your law. How long have you been practicing? See, I graduated in 2017 and officially got sworn in November 1st, 2017. So almost six years now. Almost six years. And you've always been your own boss. I, when I first graduated, um, and even right before I graduated, I was clerking for a soul, another soul practitioner. Okay. Okay. We became a two man firm for a little while. And then, um, I ended up, I had an opportunity to become general counsel for a small company that um, had a location in Georgia and Texas, and so started working for them, then COVID hit. And so they significantly downsized, and as a result, they their need for full-time in-house legal scaled back as well. Right. And right. at the same time, I wound up with an opportunity to provide outside counsel service for a company that was heavily involved in COVID test kits. Okay. And so it was the perfect opportunity for me to go ahead and move out on my own yeah. and, and hang my own shingle. I had a big customer that had a big client that had a lot of test kits and a lot of contracts that need to get reviewed and could still hang on to the the company I was general counsel for and then start picking up from there. You segued right into it, man. That's awesome. No, it's yes, good. It Radio perfect. term. Sorry, folks. Radio <laughs> term. Now, you mentioned certification certificates. That's different than your law degree. Correct. I got to believe even if the certificate may not be exactly pointed toward business law, it's still education. It's still got to help you. Absolutely. You and do apply those things. Absolutely. And, and, and in fact, it does have um, some real world applications for businesses, uh, specifically when it comes to trademarks. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of businesses, they, they come up with a mark that, that they like and, and they want to protect that mark. Right. What a lot of people don't realize is that most states, you can't actually file a trademark in most states. You can eventually get um, common law trademark protection right. that protects your name from somebody else who's in the same field or a similar field from using something that's that's similar. But the only way to actually get trademark protection is to file with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Right, right. And so that IP certificate really helped provide that, that base for me uh, to be able to provide that as a service to my business clients. And then even on the on the copyright side, uh, you know, I've got friends that are um, that do photography for for weddings, and so being able to advise them on copyright issues has been has been beneficial for me. Copyrights and, and trademarks in general are for me are always interesting. Do you research? I mean, if someone wants to brand themselves in, in some way, do you research what is out there? Do you throw it against the wall see what sticks? Absolutely. So you have to, when you're filing for a trademark, there's 40 plus international classifications that you have to look at. Only 40. Only 40. Only 40. Some odd. Wow. Um, the U.S. system actually has several hundred, breaks those down into some into a bunch of subcategories. But basically, you first have to identify, okay, what is my service or product that I'm providing? Am I providing shirts? Am I providing attorney services, professional services, education services? What kind of service am I providing? What kind of mark am I trying to trademark? Am I just trying to trademark the word, the name? Am I trying to trademark the design, the logo? And then I have to go and see, is anybody else in that same international classification using a, the same or a similar mark that I'm trying to have trademarked? Now, and then I can file. Now, when you say similar, is that uh, eye of the beholder? Is that depends on who's looking at it at that moment? Is that subjective? That's the lawyer answer of it depends. So, Which is scary if you're talking about big money. It is. And so the thing to keep in mind with trademarks, a lot of people think, well, I need a trademark to protect my business. But trademarks aren't actually designed to protect your business. Trademarks are designed to protect the consumer 
from the likelihood of confusion really as to the source of that never mark. do that, that exactly makes sense. it makes sense so the answer to your question is the similar is will this mark cause a likelihood of confusion to the consumer really as to the source too close to something that already exists correct and i guess that would be eye of the beholder correct and and what they do is they look at um the reasonable average person so would the average consumer think that me selling widgets is the same as this guy selling gidgets that are right, in the right. same general category. I got you. Now, if I want to trademark widgets for the name of a law firm and Joe wants to trademark widgets for the name of Combs, those are completely different international categories right. and that would be allowed. Technically less confusion, I guess. Correct. I guess. I have to bring it up. Funny story, forgive me. I do a lot of painting. I, I do I paint stuff. But Reese's has their orange, that burnt orange color. They have that trademark. They trademarked a color. Yes. That is cool. You I'm can, sorry, I don't know why that's cool, but yeah, it's cool. You can, you can trademark colors. You can actually trademark. One of the cases we did in law school was trademarking the inside of a restaurant and the I way that that, that restaurant that. looks. I could see that. Um, and the, the, the specific design patterns and color palettes. Another really fun one is, and there's, there's songs about it, Red Bottom Shoes. Louboutin red bottom shoes. Right, right. The red bottom shoes are trademarked, and there was actually a a trademark lawsuit dealing with the, the Louboutin shoes because a different manufacturer created an all red shoe, including the bottom. The whole thing. And Louboutin sued and said this is a violation of our trademark because wow. you made a red bottom shoe. And the other company said, no, we did not make a red bottom shoe. We made a completely red shoe. And they ended up actually winning that case. Louboutin lost that case. So really? you can actually go and buy an all red shoe that has a red bottom that's not Louboutin. I don't know why I find that cool. I find I, I don't know. I find law I think in general cool. It, it is, and um, you know, one of the fun things, especially still dealing with trademarks, is you know you get into a uh, category of trademarks that they've become so well recognized that. The international categories don't matter. For instance, Coca-Cola. Right. So well recognized. I imagine Harley Davidson's on that list. Correct. Yeah. Um, but you also run into a situation where if your name becomes so well known and so well used as a name, you can actually run the risk of losing your trademark. Escalator, for instance, used to actually be a trademark name. Really? Yeah. But everybody started using it right. for the purposes of call a moving stare. Right. It's and an so escalator. It eventually became a generic term. How about that? If you watch any Kleenex commercial, specifically the brand Kleenex, right. you will hear them say Kleenex brand facial tissue. Gotcha. Kleenex brand facial tissue because they want to make sure that you don't call anything other than Kleenex a Kleenex. A Kleenex. And here in the South, we call every soft drink known to man a Coke. Exactly. So I can see that going sideways. Exactly. Nice. Hey, right, man, I got to ask you the million-dollar question we ask almost every guest through here. There's all kinds of attorneys, lawyers, including business attorneys. Why you, man? Why you? That's, that's the hard one. So, you know. You get uh, to sell. This is where you sell. Absolutely. So people have this negative connotation of lawyers. Um, they also have this negative connotation of politicians. I happen to serve as a county commissioner, and I tell people all the time, there's two types of folks in this world I can't stand. Lawyers and politicians. Wow, you got that sewed up, don't you? And people say, well, <laughs> you're both of those, aren't you? No, I'm a, an elected official who practices law. That so, sounds like an attorney saying that. That's all I know. <laughs> so one of the things that, that's important to me is you get attorney's bills, and they nickel and dime every little oh, yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. You send an in email to them. They're going to they're going to send you an invoice for every tenth of an hour that they spend opening that email, reading that email, mm -hmm. replying to that email. If they sent, initiate an email, they're going to bill you for every little tenth of a minute. For me, I believe that I can't effectively represent my clients if we don't have open lines of communication. Right. So right. one of the things that's important to me um, is that if I'm reaching out to you to get information, I don't bill you for that. Really? I don't, I don't bill you for that because nice. I need information from you. I don't want you to be worried that you're going to get another bill from me because I called you to get information from oh, me. Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. So that's that's a big thing for me. The other thing that um, that is a reason I I try to view myself as someone who's going to um, excel in the business law realm is that I just try to be honest with people. Right. You know, I've I've been in the business world myself. I've been in different levels of management. I understand what businesses are going through, and I'm just going to be honest with you. If we can do something, hey, we're going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. If we've got, if somebody is trying to sue us and, and we've got a weak case, I'm going to be honest with you and say, hey, here's here's where our pitfalls are going to be. Here's our options. Here's going to be our best best uh, solutions. Right. And I think that's something that that really sets me apart. I'm. I don't have the the fancy multi million dollar house that a lot of people think attorneys have. Oh well, and you're self employed, so, I'm so uh, obviously yeah, you're I'm rich, self, right? You know, exactly. Obviously, and so I just try to be as as honest as I can with with my clients, be as fair as I can with my clients, and you know sometimes that's to my te- detriment. Sure, um, sure. But at the end of the day, I think that it's ultimately to my to my benefit and to my clients' benefit. Because they know that what they're getting is real. Now, business law is a catchphrase. Is there a sweet spot for you? I love contracts, and I love okay. HR. Human resources. Human resources. Really? Human resources, yeah. What kind of stuff do you run into? Change names and locations creatively, innocent, the, you know, the guilty. You know, Absolutely. You know. So one of the— I didn't expect you to say that. I, I So when I was with the lifeguard company, um, the pool management company, I helped to manage the lifeguards— as really? well. So I've been there, seen it, done it. One of the things that that I find for a lot of businesses is they don't realize the pitfalls of HR issues. I had a client that they wanted to terminate one of their employees. Right. I said, all right, what's the reason for termination? Well, we have this issue, this issue, this issue, and this issue. Okay, great. We wrote him up for this issue back in January. That is a perfectly legitimate reason. It was he was threatening to sue the company and the oh, owner lovely, and the this lovely, and that. Yeah. It, it was it was libel and he was doing it in front of customers. And so we wrote him up for it in January. I said, "All right, this is a perfect reason for termination." So I drafted up the termination documents. I said, "Here's here's where um, here's the the talking points." to use when you're in your termination meeting with him. Mm-hmm. Here's the separation agreement that says this is the reason for termination. Here's where we cite the previous issues. Here you go. He talked to me a few days later, the owner did, and he said, well, so we ended up just having a uh, a light conversation and decided that it would be best to part ways uh, amicably. And and he agreed with that. And, you know, then we, um, and then I, I wished him, well, and told him it would be a good time to to focus on his health because he had had a heart attack the previous year. Oh wow! Well, that opened the door for an EEOC complaint. Yep. And even you know, I saw that one coming. Folks. Right. The I talked to the owner about, it and he said, "But I was just trying to be friendly. We we said that we're gonna." He said, "I can't be friendly and, and express concern for somebody." I said, "No, you can't." Not when they work for you. Nope. And and that's right. Or if you're stinks. firing them, and Ooh. it stinks. And so he did end up filing an EEOC complaint. We. Went back and forth. We provided uh, all the documentation. Fortunately, him and I had had the conversation about the reason for termination in writing ahead of time, and I provided contemporaneously with our normal practices the documentation and the script of termination. And I pro- and so we provided all of that as evidence. We fortunately had another employee who had a similar health issue previously who we did not terminate. So we were able to show that we had similarly situated employees, but, and then of course this all happened over COVID. So, so it dragged the entire EEOC process out. Um, and fortunately, uh, back in December, they finally issued what's called a right to sue letter. You never actually win as the employer in EEOC complaints. The best you can hope for is that they tell the employee that, well, we're not going to pursue it. So you now have the right to sue. Right. Um, and then they have 90 days at that point to actually file a lawsuit if they're going to. And he did not. And so the time you're closed pa- out. You're past that 90 days. Right. But we spent a lot of time and management resources. Sounds like it defending this at the EEOC. And so for me, if I can be a resource for for my customers to say, for my clients to say, hey, terminating an employee is never fun, 
right? No. You're, you're talking about somebody's livelihood and their ability to put food on their table. But if I can be a resource that can help them through that process and make sure that it is as amicable as possible, but without opening up right. unnecessarily the risks of lawsuits, let me do that. Right. Let me be that, that resource. Let me be that resource that, that helps advise you on employment agreements ahead of time and what you can and can't do on different salary issues, especially once you start talking, again, going back to my time in the pool industry, seasonal staff. Right. right. You know, how do you deal with even your full-time staff when they're going to be working 60 hours in the summer, but 20 hours a week in the winter? Mm -hmm. And how do you handle the, the pays there? And so I've found that the two biggest issues facing most businesses are contract related and HR related. And gotcha. so if I can provide those resources and those are my primary focus areas. I can provide a business majority of the legal needs that they have. Do you recommend, and, and I don't like the word any, and I don't want to say any business, any company. Do you recommend a letter of, of termination that, that you drew up for, say, most companies? I don't, I'm not going to say every company. I would say that a lot of the time, I would say that most businesses are well suited to know exactly what they're going to say when they're terminating an employee, right? To have that script written out to say, these are the reasons for termination. These are examples of past similar issues, past conduct that has led us to termination. Here's your, here's when your final paycheck's going to be. Here's what happens with your benefits. If, if they have benefits, right? When you're doing a layoff, here's the information for Applying for unemployment, we don't determine whether or not you will actually receive unemployment. That will be determined by the unemployment office mm -hmm. and, and just provide that script. And then when that employee starts asking additional questions, one of the lines that I have on there is reference back to what was already said right? and say, these are, these are the reasons for termination and, and go back to it so that you don't start getting into heated arguments, heated discussions, or accidentally say something unintentional that again opens you up to potential don't introduce lawsuit. anything new more exactly or less. um i actually yeah. just watched a uh, a video on um tiktok yesterday as a matter of fact a former walmart employee recorded his termination meeting and they admitted that they terminated him for the days that he was in the hospital for a workers comp related injury wow and i'm like so. Again, that's that's a pitfall that had they talked to somebody in the legal department and said, uh, no, you, you guys cannot terminate him for that. So now that guy owns like 5% of Walmart. Or he will once he files his suit. Yes, he, and that'll be soon. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. So what are some things you won't compromise on? So Compromise is a big word. It, it is. I won't compromise on my integrity. Bless you for that. Uh, you know, as an attorney... My job is to represent the business's interests right. or my client's interest. I'm not there to represent my interest. I will give you my opinion and my advice. Um, and, and if you choose not to take it, very good. We can still go the, a different route. But if you start asking me to do things that I don't think are honest, that I will back out of. Gotcha. Uh, for example, if somebody were to file a breach of contract lawsuit against a client, we just have absolutely no defense. And you tell me that you want me to still file an answer that challenges validity of the lawsuit, that challenges how uh, everything that they are saying, Right. I won't do that. I'll tell you the best I can do is basically file and admit to everything that's true and maybe if there's one or two things that there's a minor discrepancy, I will try to distinguish those. But generally speaking, I'm not going to just sit here and do outright denials right. when it's when it's right. accurate. I imagine in your line of work, you see that a lot. You do, unfortunately, and, and um, you know, there's some fantastic attorneys out there, but oh, there yeah. oh, there gosh, are yeah. some that um, that probably do not need to be practicing and have a win at any cost mentality, and and I don't think that does anybody justice. It really doesn't. Um, you're going to spend, if I drag my client through that, we're going to spend more money, more time, more effort, and for what? To be right where we were going to be anyway. It gets back to something you said earlier about nickel and diming. Exactly. Yeah, we can fight this for another six, eight months, and you're going to pay me. And Oh, yeah. And that's the thing oh, yeah. that a lot of people don't, uh, don't realize 
especially in Georgia, Georgia, um, Georgia, as as most states, follow the American rule. Okay. And the American rule basically says that when it comes to breach of contract cases, each party is responsible for their own attorney's fees. Gotcha. Unless you have a contract that says otherwise, it says the, it's written in the prevailing and, and party. And some do. And, right. And, and some, some, do, yeah. some contracts do. There are some states like Texas uh, says that if the plaintiff files, the plaintiff, if they prevail, is entitled to attorney's fees, but the defendant if they prevail, would not be entitled to attorney's fees. How about that? Um, so that's kind of interesting. But generally speaking, it's the American rule. And so even if I sit here and argue and fight all day long and we do manage to somehow win, you just spent all that money on attorney's fees. Yeah. yeah. So that's why you know I try. I will not do anything that I'm going to unintentionally cause you to have to spend more money. I got you. It's almost one of those no one really wins if it does get to court. It's very sort much true. And and in fact, it's one of the reasons that I've started um, offering mediation services. That's smart. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so in fact, I was uh, doing a mediation before I got here today. Um, you know, when, when the judges order cases to mediation, they typically tell the parties, look, if we hear it, no, one side's going to be happy and one side's not. If you, if you work with a mediator and try to find a resolution amongst yourselves, then you might be able to to find um, some peace and happiness that that everybody walks away good. You know, one of the things that I really try to do, especially when there is a contract dispute issue, I try to lean on some of that mediation experience and say, well, what options do we have? If if they owe us money, what kinds of terms are are we willing to extend? You know, maybe somebody's just having some, having a down year Mm -hmm. and we need to not provide them additional services, but provide them an opportunity to, to pay off what what we um, satisfy what they the owe contract exactly. more or less. Yeah, I'm exactly. With you. I'm with you. One of the things that this is my biggest fault with law school. I can win judgments all day long for you. We can prove that they owe you the money, and I can go and get a judgment from you. Mm-hmm. And a judgment from a court is a piece of paper. That's right. And they don't teach you in law school how to collect on those judgments. That's a whole different podcast. It is. Honestly, it is. It is. And um, and so one of the important things to remember and, and that I try to remind my clients is if we can work something out instead of just taking it immediately to court and getting a judgment, right. we're much more likely to actually see money. To actually physically get it. And spend less money doing so. In the process. Exactly. In the process. Cool. I know there's a website. What's the website? So the website is www.awardlaw.net. Again, that first initial, last name. Mm-hmm. Makes award, awardlaw.net. Award law. It's perfect. And that's dot net, though. Dot net. It's dot net. You're on Facebook? I'm on Facebook. Instagram? What are not you on? on Instagram. I, I do have Me a uh, Facebook account. Um, do not have a business Instagram account. That's um, right. But uh, I do have that Facebook. Nice. And that's Award Law LLC. Award Law LLC. Perfect. Perfect. What did we miss? Anything before we get out of here? We're going to wrap I, it up, man. I think we've just about hit it all. We've gone almost 30 minutes. Moved pretty quick. It did. Oh, wow. The producer's playing the music. That means wrap up, Tom. It does. I appreciate you having me, Tom. You're very welcome, Alex. Thanks for being here. Al- uh, Award Law. I almost called him Alex Law. Award Law LLC, awardlaw.net. Good guy. Get to know him. I'm Tom Sheldon. Another great show. Talk to you soon.